This December, the final film in the Skywalker saga, Rise of the Skywalker, hits theaters. In anticipation, I'm reviewing each of the Star Wars episodes in release order. Today, we're in part two, so we're talking about The Empire Strikes Back. Hi, my name is Sean, and I started this channel because I was driving everyone around me crazy talking about movies way too much. If you can relate, you're probably in the right place. Consider clicking that subscribe button. With that in mind, go ahead and join me down below in the comment section. Share your take on The Empire Strikes Back. Do you love it? Do you hate it? Is it overrated? Is it underrated? I would love to have a nice, lively discussion about this movie that a whole bunch of us grew up and absolutely love. Feel free to spoil away. I don't know who would be be worried that they haven't seen the movie, but you can spoil away down below in the comment section. Also, as I mentioned at the beginning, I'm reviewing all of the Star Wars episodes in anticipation. Here's the playlist right up here where those will appear. This is only the second part, so there's only two videos in the playlist now, but with each week, there will be more. And if you're watching in the future, they're all right up there. With that said, I'm gonna kick things off with kind of a retrospective on where the movie came from. A bunch of this information comes from this book, The Making of the Empire Strikes Back. Very cool book looking at where the Empire Strikes Back came from based entirely on the interviews and documents from back in the 70s, 80s, uh, early 80s, not even late 80s, only early 80s, right around when all of it happened. Uh, if you're a massive Star Wars fan, you need to check out J.W. L- Rinsler's making of Star Wars trilogy of books. They're very cool. With that said, let's get started talking about where this particular movie came from. When Star Wars came out, obviously nobody knew it was going to be the cultural phenomena that it was and still is, but they also didn't know if it was just gonna totally bomb at the box office. So they actually hired Alan Dean Foster to ghost write the novelization of Star Wars, and in his contract, they hired him to write a sequel to Star Wars that was in intended to be the basis for a sequel to Star Wars that could be made low budget. So if Star Wars failed, they would take his book and adapt it into a low budget sequel to the film. And that book was released in 1978, uh, Splinter of the Mind's Eye. It's the first Star Wars kind of extended universe book out there. Of course, you have the novelization first, some kitty novels, and then this is the next continuing adventure in the Star Wars universe and the beginning of the extended universe. But as it turns out, Star Wars did pretty well for itself at the box office, so they abandoned those plans, they abandoned that novel as the basis for a low budget sequel, and they decided to go all out and do a big, blockbuster sequel. So right after the release of Star Wars, it's pretty clear this was gonna be a big hit, and Lucas went to work on the sequel to Star Wars, Star Wars 2. And by the end of the year, he'd already written a 19 page treatment outlining his idea for the next film. Some of the basics of Empire Strikes Back were already present. Luke's training, Cloud City, Han's betrayal, already in that 19 page original document that he wrote. He then passed scripting duties to science fiction writer Lee Brackett to write the first draft of the film. And within just two or three months, turnaround, she provided the first draft in February of 1978. Structurally speaking, it's actually not terribly different from the film that we got. All of the big main set pieces are there inside of it. One huge, huge difference though is that the Vader father twist reveal is not in that version of the script and instead Luke's father appears to him as a force ghost. Another interesting thing that's in this version of the script is that Darth Vader has a castle with gargoyles around it and that's surrounded by lava. This, of course, later went on to be very prominent inside of the EU and then it showed up in Rogue One, but it was all the way back in her version of Empire Strikes Back, back in February 1978. Tragically, though, she died just weeks after turning in her draft of the film in March of 1978. And while structurally her script was pretty close to the film that was made, Tonally speaking, in regards to the dialogue, it didn't really match the voice and the vibe that George Lucas had created with Star Wars. It felt a lot more like traditional science fiction of the time rather than this new thing that George Lucas had been creating. So needing to continue work on the film, he decided to write the next couple of drafts. At this point in time is actually where the episodes were first introduced. As we mentioned in the previous video, when Star Wars was released, it was just called Star Wars. It wasn't Star Wars Episode Four. It wasn't 
wasn't A New Hope. It was just Star Wars. And while he was writing his drafts of The Empire Strikes Back, he introduced this idea and called it Episode 2 inside of it. But then at the same time, he also had this thought of what if Vader was in fact Luke's father? And then he started like, reinterpreting what he wrote in the first film and developing this whole backstory about Anakin and Obi-Wan, the conflict between them, the fall of Anakin turning into Vader, in which case he realized this wasn't episode two, this was the second episode in the second trilogy, and thus, episode five. Around the same time, he started making some pretty big, bold statements about how many Star Wars movies he was planning on making. At one point in time, he said he was gonna make 10 Star Wars movies after Empire Strikes Back, and he also claimed to have had 12 page outlines for each of these films that he was working towards, but the actual number of movies that he was planning for Star Wars kind of depended on the interview, and he said a lot of different and conflicting things between about 1978 and the release of Return of the Jedi. Likewise, because his producer role for the film was getting so big, he decided he didn't want to direct the film himself, so he went to actually one of his former professors from film school, Irvin Kirshner, asked him to direct it. Irvin Kirshner was pretty skeptical at first to direct the film because sequels at that point in time had a really bad reputation. He'd mostly done kind of small personal films, but eventually George was able to talk him into it and he signed on to direct the film. To finish up the script, they hired Lawrence Kasdan, whom Lucas had been working with on the Raiders of the Lost Ark script. So with the input of producer Gary Kurtz, director Irvin Kirshner, and of course George Lucas, Lawrence Kasdan went off and finished The Empire Strikes Back and history was made as it became one of the great movies of all time, one of the great sequels of all time. There's actually so much more interesting stuff about the making of this movie, even like the funding of it. George Lucas almost having a meltdown trying to get all the money to get this movie made, even though it was like, like a guaranteed hit, you would think from our perspective, guaranteed hit, but there was a lot of fear like sequels at the time are not what they are today where everything is a sequel. And so there's a lot of fear that the movie wouldn't, work, wouldn't make money. So once again, all of that is in this massive, massive book right here. Highly recommend it. Check it out. With that said, let's get started talking about the good. Right off the bat, Empire Strikes Back does what all great sequels do. It doesn't just rehash the first film. It expands the mythology. It takes our characters to new places, both literally and metaphorically, and it tells a very different type of story. Whereas the first Star Wars is about this kind of ragtag group of people coming together to rescue a princess and destroy a weapon, Empire Strikes Back is about that group splitting up and going into hiding. Whereas Star Wars was about this group of people, several of them discovering that they're heroes through victory, in Empire, our heroes discover failure and they lose at the end of the film. It's such a different story and it's such different themes, but in so many ways is a continuation of everything that was set up and established in the first film. Another thing the movie does so well is have such distinct environments all throughout the film. So you start things off, you're on Hoth. It's an ice planet. It's basically black and white while you're on this planet. And then you go into space and you're on these Imperial Star Destroyers or you're in the Millennium Falcon and it's very space-like. And then you go to Dagobah and it's a swamp and it's green and brown and black. And then you go to Cloud City and it's orange and these vibrant colors. And everywhere you go has different dangers inside of it. On the base, they're being attacked by these outsiders. When you're in space, you have these people being tracked down. Or if you're on the Imperial ships, you're in danger because if you fail, Vader will kill you. When you get to Hoth, the danger there, excuse me, when you get to Dagobah, the danger is kind of more like this internal struggle of making wise choices. It doesn't feel like a safe space, even though it's this training space. And then we get to Cloud City at the end of it and betrayal is inside of the mix. As soon as you get there, you're like, I don't trust this guy. Like, he's kind of cool, this Lando fellow, but I don't know that I trust him. And it, it just is this really interesting way of finding conflict that's different for each environment, a color scheme that's different for each environment, so you feel this progress of change throughout the entire film. The movie also has a very distinct three-act structure to it, where the acts are very clearly defined because they're so closely tied to those environments that we talked about before. Act one, we are on Hoth, and our mission is to escape Hoth. Then we go into the second act of the film, and our team kind of splits out, so there's kind of like the A and B second act. So 
Act 2A is Luke Skywalker on Dagobah training, and then Act 2B is Han and Leia and the crew on the Millennium Falcon trying to escape from the Imperials who are chasing them. Then we go to the third act of the film, all of it kind of comes back together in Cloud City, and once again, they're trying to escape from the Imperials as this is kind of the running theme of they're on the run throughout the entire run movie. Which it's, it's, it's interesting that the only one of these where they're not trying to escape is Luke on Dagobah. And when he leaves Dagobah, what happens? You have Yoda saying, no, don't you have to complete your training. He's escaping his training even though he's being asked to stay. Every else, every single one of these other acts in the film is all about escaping a place, and he's at a place he's supposed to stay, and he chooses to escape and leave to save his friends. That was interesting, even as I was writing that, just the way the story's structured and the implications and how it ties in with themes and everything, I was just like, this is just such a cool movie. Next thing I wanna talk about are the special effects and the visual effects inside of the film. Now, if you're one of my younger viewers, and many of you are, you kinda of grew up in the CGI era, and so you probably see the model work a little bit different than the way that I do. I learned to love movies watching model work, and so CGI has always looked kinda of strange to me, and it's only just now starting to feel a little bit more natural. I, by default, just kinda of love to see model work inside of things and finding more visual ways with real items just feels more convincing to me but when it comes to like if you look at w what is inside of this movie and compare it to what was in Star Wars I mean they took that groundbreaking work inside the first film and they just went what is every wild and crazy thing that we can do with the, this technology that we've invented? And so the movie kicks off with the Battle of Hoth and you have these snow speeders flying around over people on the ground around these walking AT-ATs and like tripping them up and blowing them to pieces compared to what they were doing just three years before. I mean, this is a massive step forward in with the technology that they were doing and it, it looks so much better too. And there's much smoother motion. They have a lot more variety in the, what the ships are able to do and it's like working with humans on the ground at certain points in time. And this is just the opening act of the th film. From there, you have the Millennium Falcon flying through asteroids and landing inside of things. Um, and it does, like, there's such a massive leap forward in the quality. Now, they had figured the technology out. They had a bigger budget. They probably had a lot more time. And it just shows in what they were able to do inside of this film. And it, like, it, this stuff still looks just gorgeous to me. I think even that they were just so impressed with what they were able to do that they absolutely went for it in the staging of the space battles. We'll start talking about that asteroid sequence once again when the, we start talking about the music, but just the sweeping motions of the Millennium Falcon and all of it with TIE fighters hitting things, the way that it's choreographed with the music, I just think is, is just phenomenal. And all of it's like that. Uh, these shots uh, in, in the escape from Cloud City where the Millennium Falcon flies behind a cloud and kind of swings back and there's like a silhouette around it. I mean, it's just a gorgeous shot. And no, no one had ever shot anything like that before. Like that sort of like a ship behind clouds and things like it just had never happened before. And it still looks gorgeous. 39 years later. Then of course we got to talk about the action inside of the film and as I talked about with the act structure and the environments, once again every action sequence is different from the last. That doesn't repeat certain types of things. You're not just seeing like l the same lightsaber battle over and over and over again. And even as I'm saying that, like you think like the Phantom Mantis Menace has a ton of Jedi's battling droids and stuff like that, but it's all kind of the same thing of them spinning around and blasting leaders back at droids and th things like that. This movie does the opposite of that. Every single sequence is different. We start off and you have Luke trying to escape and battling the big space bear wampa creature out there. And then we have the Battle of Hoth, which is kind of our first full battle inside of Star Wars because you had Yavin, but that's just a dogfight in space. This one, you have flying ships, you have people on the ground, you have these big vehicles and stuff like that. So it's, and then you have spaceships shooting down and they're shooting from the planet up at the spaceships. It's full blown Star Wars space battle inside of it. 
and you get the war aspect of Star Wars in the Battle of Hoth, in the scope, the size of all of it. And like I said, even inside of that battle, you have all sorts of things happening inside of it that are exciting. Then we go into the middle act of it, and you've got a lot of chase sequences with the Millennium Falcon inside of asteroids and things like that, that as I mentioned before, I think it's just an incredible sequence, but it's different. It's a chase, and they're trying to outmaneuver and outpilot, and they're flying through cracks and things like that, and into caves. Then you have Luke on Dagobah, and it's a training sequence. And as a person that loves training sequences and montages and things like that, putting that in a Star Wars movie, I absolutely love it. And so you're there, and it's not necessarily action in the traditional sense of good guy versus bad guy, but you're watching training, and it has a similar sort of excitement as you watch Luke gain certain abilities and powers. And then you move into the final act sequence of the film and you have uh, Han, or excuse me, you have Leia and Lando kind of running through these hallways, blasting people and stuff like that. So you have a gunfight inside of it, more traditional stuff that you saw a lot of in the first Star Wars movie. And then we get kind of our first great lightsaber battle of Star Wars. Important one in the first Star Wars movie between Obi-Wan and Darth Vader, but you can't really call that a great in regards to being a lightsaber battle itself. This one is just, it's a great sequence. Even if you take the twist out of it, it's a great sequence in and of itself for just the character development inside of it, the taunting of Vader, between Vader and Luke. And then it's just a cool, traditional um, lightsaber battle. You know, in the especially in the prequels, the Jedi went very much kind of Asian martial arts infused uh, martial arts stuff in the Jedi bat lightsaber battles, which I love all of that. I love what they were doing, but I also love the fact that you have these ones with the guy that doesn't have all the cool Jedi tricks and the robot suit guy. They don't, they can't do the flippy stuff and they're not as cool as, as Darth Maul and things like that. So I love that we have, we have both of these things in existence, but once again, it's a totally different action sequence from what we got in all of the rest of the film. And we got our final escape as Luke kind of falls down, gets caught and rescued, and then they have to fly fly off in the end. But every action sequence is different from the last one and adds something new inside of it. And there's an emotion to each one of them. It's not just flippant stuff happening. You really care. It ties to the purpose of that section of the film, the escape, the story arc, what, what's going on with Luke. And then let's start talking about the music music of this film. I think this is my favorite of the Star Wars scores. All of the Star Wars scores are fantastic. Um, I haven't been as crazy about the sequel soundtracks. Those ones haven't been as memorable to me, but the original trilogy, the prequels, John Williams scores were just unbelievably good, fantastic. And this one, I believe, is my favorite inside of the mix. This is the one where we first get the Imperial March. We, sometimes we forget that because the Imperials were in the first film, but the Imperial March itself doesn't appear until this film where we get so much Imperial stuff with them, tracking down, hunting down, striking back at the rebellion. So you get the Imperial March. Um, I referenced this before, but the sequence where the Millennium Falcons and the asteroids it just has one of the most rousing and exciting musical things that I, I've ever heard of or just watching it. And every time it starts going, no, 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 no. It just, it, it fits so well with this exciting sequence as they're escaping and flying through things. It amplifies every moment and it's cut together as these high notes are with explosions and swoops away from things. Fantastic, fantastic music, highlighting a fantastic sequence. And then you get on Dagobah and you get kind of the theme for Yoda as well as the Force. And another sequence that just relies so heavily on the music itself being just phenomenal is the one where, where Luke doesn't believe, tries to lift up his, his X-Wing and he can't, like he fails to lift it up. And so it's like, you ask the impossible. And so then Yoda licks, lifts, up, lifts it up with the Force and he's this little itty bitty guy, holds out his hand. And, you know, the shots themselves could just be, look, a puppet's holding his hands out and wiggling a little bit while a thing lifts up. But because of the score is just, you like feel the power of the force. Like it's the majesty of the force. All of it like hits you in that moment as all of this happening and you see the X-Wing lift up. Just incredibly powerful music inside of it. And so for me, those three things specifically are what just kind of elevate this one to the next level. And 
you know, it's, it's how do you how do you pick your favorite Star Wars theme when um, you know the Duel of the Fates and Phantom Menace is just fantastic, and then you know Anakin's theme is actually really good music. I, I just John Williams, I, it, John Williams has a lot of perfect scores, and this once again is one of them uh, for me. Then I want to talk about some specific character arcs inside of the film. We'll kick things off with Luke. Talked about extensively my discussion of the first Star Wars, just how incredibly whiny Luke was in that film, but you see his potential. He's, he's willing to go on the adventure, and so it's kind of fun. You get to this film, and he's uh, the hero of the rebellion now because of what he did, and he's kind of this rising star. And the whininess has kind of gone away. He's still kind of just like impatient and kind of can be annoying because he's just like so frustrated with everything and just wants to get what, where he's trying to get to. And all of that sets up these amazing moments with Yoda where finally he gets to Dagobah and there's this little green guy that's super annoying. As we were rewatching this last night, my son was like, Dad, why is Yoda acting like this? Why is Yoda not acting like he acts in the Clone Wars? Like I, this isn't the way that he normally acts. He's like, right. Right, because he's testing him. Like, he's, he's messing with a little bit to just see how he will respond to someone that's not who he's looking for. And um, it's just set up so nicely to kind of show how that whininess is now translated into impatience inside of this film. He's matured a little bit, but he's still a very immature person, but he still also has a whole lot of potential. I'm someone that loves stories of becoming. Um, so some people, when it comes to like superhero movies and stuff like that, they're kind of burned out on origin stories. And when they hear they're doing a new version of whatever, they don't want the origin retold. I, I'm kind of the opposite. Like, I just love origin stories. That most naturally resonates with me when you see someone grow into their potential. And at the beginning, you just, they have a desire. You see a little hints of what they can be. And then by the end of it, it's fully formed. And one of the things that Star Wars does so well is it does that throughout these three films with Luke Skywalker of he is a whiny farm boy. And by the end of that movie, you have kind of the payoff of the whiny farm boy. He's got a skill and he just blew up the Death Star. But he's still the whiny, like he's still kind of the whiny guy in that movie. And then here... He's because he knows he's the warrior. He's no longer the farm boy. He's this hero, but he's has got a lot of faults. And so you're seeing him become something powerful. He has so much skill, but he still hasn't grown up yet. And so you see that when he decides to go off and face Vader too soon, costs him his hand, he fails in it. And that they allowed our hero to fail. In the first one, farm boy blows up the Death Star. Here, hero fails. His friend gets taken away. He loses his hand. They barely survive the whole ordeal. And he learns out his dad is a kind of a bad guy inside of the mix. So it's just like really powerful stuff inside of this. Of course, we're quick talk about Yoda inside of this. One of the great mentor characters of all time. Like how do you top Obi-Wan, who's another great Star Wars character? You create someone so different, so quirky and so weird. Another area where like the puppet just looks better than to me than CGI because it's a real thing. I like it. I know it's a puppet. Like I can see that it's a puppet, but um, it's a thing that's there. And so to my brain that's grew up on watching practical things, that's still more convincing to me than far more animated CGI computer animated Yodas that we've gotten in later films. But, you know, the, the mentor that has such an odd personality, even the way he talks is interesting. Everything is this wise nugget or a joke that he's making. Everything turns everything on its head while stating in a way that turns a sentence structure on its head inside of it. All of this being the perfect contrast to what Luke was looking for. Some of what we talked about before in the previous film, the amazing amount of contrast inside of the first Star Wars and Luke, this person that's easily frustrated, he wants another Obi-Wan who kind of answers questions a little bit more directly as someone that functions more kind of like him that he can look up to. And then he finds the little green guy that's intentionally annoying him and banging on his R2 unit and mine, 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 and doing stuff like that. That's not what Luke was looking for. It's the contrast that he needed, no, be needed though because of his impatience. And so from there, we also have some other people inside of this one. Han and Leia, finally, uh, they decide to, they, they set this up as a love triangle, pretty clearly establishing that George Lucas was making up a lot of this stuff as it goes along. And you get a nice romantic kiss between brother and sister inside of it. And then Luke like leaning back, like, ha ha, look what I just got. Kind of weird, but they move kind of 
from our love triangle quickly to Han and Leia, and you kind of see the um, their bickering is actually this mutual respect and the opposites attract situation, and just a really nice romance throughout the whole film as they just have great chemistry between the two of them. You put them in a room and you see the banter. You see how much they like drive each other crazy, but at least at the same how much they want to be around each other. And the movie just kind of spaces this out and they create this scenario where she has to go with him. So they're off on this adventure together. That I think just makes for a, a nice place to have their romance kind of form together. All of it leading up to kind of this conclusion where um, after it's kind of, they, they realize that they love each other there. They've got feelings for each other. They're on Cloud City and you get this uh, line that led to this shirt that I'm wearing right here that uh, Harrison Ford actually improvised on the set. There's actually documented. They have the full transcript of the conversations that were going on where they were like fighting over what the line should be at that point in time, what was in the script, what they shot, thought they should do, and all these different opinions. And then Harrison Ford goes with, uh, uh, she says, I love you. And he says, I know. And, you know, that's just like such iconic to us. That's, of course, of course, what he would say in that moment. But throughout the film, once again, you get, you have Han not fully changing. He wants to be here. He's a good guy, but he has things that he need, like, he has a past that is haunting him, and that brings us to kind of this conclusion inside of this film where his past catches up with him with the way that they're brought down is that a bounty hunter that was out to get him and wants to sell him the job of the hut tracks him down, and that was their undoing inside of this, that he Boba Fett was the one person that kind of figured out the details inside of all of this, and then what, some of this being the thing that made Boba Fett so intriguing as this character that has very little screen time inside of these movies. Doesn't do all that much, but has been beloved for 40 years since this movie came out. Actually, before this movie came out, because he was in the holiday special, even a little bit before that, in this little animated sequence. But, um, you know, Boba Fett being the one breaking up our love story and kind of exploring once again this Han Solo character and his journey to be a hero. Is he an anti-hero? What is he inside the mix? Well, he's a guy with the past and it finally caught up with him. Then as you also talk about the Han Solo, you got to talk about Lando and the betrayal inside of this one. Just a real nice touch. Like Lando doesn't show up until the second half of the film. He's not in very much of it because there's so much stuff going on, but he's just kind of played with such a nice swagger and charisma and nuance to the character that um, like you very quickly um, kind of root for Lando. You can both be, feel betrayed by him, that like they trusted him and then he but sold them out. And so quickly at the same time, you learn like he was lied to. We've been watching Vader the whole movie like being just treacherous with people and killing them. And so we can naturally see like that guy shows up and tells you you lie, you, you kind of go along with it. And as soon as Lando has the chance, like he tries to set it right as quickly as possible. As soon as he realizes this is way worse than he thought, like this is not, <laughs> this is not a part of the bargain. As soon as that happens, he starts to put his plan together and is willing to sacrifice everything that he's built for himself. Like he's like abandoned Cloud City. Um, as soon as he really knows what's going on, which even in a little bit of screen time, they're able to give Lando this full arc of you feel the betrayal, you feel the redemption, all of it. And of course you get the... Um, his <laughs> swagger on screen in full display. And then we got to talk about our big reveal twist inside of this one where we learn who is Luke Sk Skywalker's father. Well, according to Darth Vader, it's him. And of course, we know that that's true. At the time the movie came out, people didn't fully know, like, is Vader lying? I, don't know. I wonder what, what was kind of going on there. And um, But that reveal happens inside of this film. It's kind of one of the great movie twists of all time. We've been talking about Anakin, Luke's father, and like, even early, as soon as Luke shows up, his uncle and aunt are talking about who he's too much like his father. Whoop. No, I am your father. And we realize, okay, well, there's a good reason right there why you don't want him to be like his father. Um, and just powerful, powerful stuff that starts to tie all these things together that, like, as much as Lucas was making stuff as he goes along, there's elements to it was like... Besides the Leia thing that felt a little bit forced and had contradicting stuff, th with what Obi-Wan said in the previous film, like this starts to like make such a compelling narrative pretty quickly inside of it. And you can see the wheels turning as he's writing this stuff down. And um, of course, it turned into the prequel trilogy and this saga that we're talking about now, right now. But that simple thought, like imagine you have this movie, there's a draft of it where Vader isn't Luke's, uh, Luke's father, 
And then you have that thought. And all of Star Wars is recontextualized in that one thought. This series exists that I'm creating right now. That's the end of the Skywalker saga because of that one thought that he had. Vader is Luke's father. That's that's crazy to you, how profound that is of where we are in this moment is because he had that single thought inside of his head that led to this moment right now that I'm talking to you through this video. And then, of course, the movie comes to a close and our heroes have lost. The rebellion is in bad shape. Han has been taken away. Luke has lost his hand. And it just ends on this downer note. I mean, there's no guarantee that we're going to get a third film. And it ends with them losing and Luke learning some pretty bad family news that he's having to process inside of all of this. Uh, all of this making for just one of the classic sequels of all time that for for 40 years, people have been trying to copy it and do their own version of it. And they, you know, they say, oh, we're trying to do Empire Strikes Back and make a darker sequel and one where the heroes lose. Very few people have been able to pull it off. Credibly influential example of how to do a sequel right and just a great film overall. But from there, we got to move on to the bad. I don't really have much bad to say about this film. If I had to say something, the first 20 minutes or so might be a little bit clunky with the way the story works. It starts off with the Imperials shooting out these drones and then we need to establish where all of our characters are at and send Luke off on his journey. We want to have a little bit of action in there. And so because of that, we kind of have this little side quest with Luke and the Wampa, and then he's out in the out kind of freezing and he has a vision. And it's, it, you know, it, it's a little bit wonky the way that it's kind of structured inside of it. There's actually a, a bunch of deleted sequences that are were shot involving the Wampas invading inside of the rebel base and them be, like being locked in a room. And there's a sequence during the invasion of the base where C-3PO rips a sign off a door. And so some stormtroopers run into a room that has a Wampa inside of it and stuff like that. I don't know if that sequence would have made, kind of fleshed it out a little bit better, made it feel a little bit less like a side, side quest or something like that, a little bit more consistent. That's the closest thing that I have to a negative is just kind of maybe that small pacing issue right there at the beginning of this film. But in general, this is how you do a sequel. This is how you do it right and build, make things bigger and better at the same time and just make a classic film that stands side by side with its classic original. Real quick, before I give you my score on this one, be sure to tell me what you thought down below in the comments section. I know a lot of us, this is a very beloved film. If you're kind of newer to the franchise or you're the person that thinks this movie's overrated, very interested to hear your take and kind of that perspective on the film from you know non-people just gushing about it like I am inside of this. Also, so you remember, I've got that playlist right up here where all of my reviews inside of the series will be. So if you're watching this as it happens, you can come back later and find more inside of there. Or if you're watching in the future, they're all right up there in that playlist. Empire Truly is one of the great movies of all time. It established a sequel template that people have been trying to copy for 40 years with very limited success. This is how you do it right. This is how you do a coming of age story right. It's how you do a space fantasy movie right. This is a great movie that I have loved and has been with me my whole life. It's an A+, it's a 10 out of 10 on the entertainment scale. This is a movie that everyone must see. Be sure to check out that playlist right over there for the other reviews inside of this series. If you want my take on all the Star Wars movies real quick from a, from a year ago, you can check out my ranking of them right down there. Thank you so much for watching and keep talking movies too much.